All right, I think we're ready to get started. Um, once again, welcome everyone to um, the US MAP webinar. Uh, my name is Jackie Petrie from NREL. I'm going to be um, running the technical side of Zoom today. So um, if you have any uh, technical difficulties, feel free to send me a chat. Um, thanks for joining us once again. We're going to quickly go through a couple Zoom housekeeping items before we get started. Um, today, you have two options for connecting to audio. You can listen through your computer, um, or you can also listen by telephone if one of those options isn't working. Um, you can find the um, uh, icon in the bottom left corner with the microphone and select the up arrow next to it. Um, that will allow you to change your audio settings if you need to do that throughout the presentation. Uh, we are recording the presentation though, so if you need to um, access it at a later date, you can go back and listen to it then. This is a reminder to all of our panelists um, to make sure you mute your audio when you're not presenting. And if at any point during the presentation you have a question, you can submit it through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You'll notice there's both Q&A and chat. Um, try to keep your questions in that Q&A panel just so we make sure we don't miss anything. Um, if you have technical difficulties, you can um, chat me in the chat box. Um, but feel free to submit those questions at the presentation and we will get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, like I said, the presentation is being recorded and it will be made available on the US MAP website um, in the next couple days. So um, Brian, if you can go to the next slide. So this is um, where you can find it. Um, if you go to that news and events tab up at the top and then go down to the September 30th webinar, uh, we'll have a link in the coming days. So you can always check back there. With that, I'm gonna hand things over to Laura Shellis to kick us off with today's presentation. Thanks, Jackie. Um, good morning, everyone. So today I get the honor of introducing Brian Habersberger from Dow DuPont. Um, I'm also excited to announce that Dow DuPont is the newest member of the US MAP Consortium. So the timing here is quite perfect. So Brian, we're excited to have you on the team. Um, Brian is a polymer physicist with a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota. And for the past six years, he has been the R&D focal point for PV encapsulation materials at Dow, where he's responsible for product development and PV application expertise. I know personally, he is my go-to person to ask anything polymers about. So Brian, I'm super excited um, to learn more from you today. And with that, please take it away. Great, thank you, Laura. Thank you for the opportunity to present here. Just one, one quick correction. We, we were Dow and then we were Dow DuPont and now we're back to being Dow again. So there was this merger and split. Apologies. Um, but uh, Dow and DuPont are now uh, uh, two separate entities uh, once again. Um, but today I'll be telling you, uh, I'm going to be giving a pretty high level review of uh, encapsulation technologies, but kind of the alternative, uh, much too wordy title for the talk is everything I wanted to know about encapsulants, but I was afraid to ask. Of course, we're at the US map, so there's going to be some angle on perovskites as well. So kind of the, the big question that you think of is, well, how are we going to re-engineer encapsulants for perovskite devices? And if you're like me, you know, uh, maybe one thing about perovskites for PV, it's that they're extremely moisture sensitive. Um, so this is an actual photo of me uh, at work. Um, and like most people, you know, I get to work, I put my hat on and I have to access the machine. Of course, at, at, at Dow, the machine that we're accessing is the machine that makes polymer. So really this is a very simple process. We're just going to find the knob uh, that controls WBTR and turn it to zero. That's all we need to do, right? Uh, to get our encapsulants um, ready for this, this much more sensitive uh, applications space. Uh, start off with a bit of a joke, but uh, moving on to the uh, rest of the talk here, I'm gonna uh, give, again, like I said, a, a very high level uh, review of encapsulant materials and the history of how they've been used in this industry. So a, a wide variety of, of materials will be uh, covered relatively briefly here. I'm going to some detail about exactly how the molecular control to engineer the um, properties that you want works in these polymer families. Uh, then move on to the encapsulant, which is different from the raw material, uh, how it's formulated and how it's manufactured, um, focusing on the uh, most prominent uh, technologies that are practiced today, uh, including EVA, polyolefin, uh, and uh, TPO. 
Then moving on to the critical properties and encapsulants, uh, what are encapsulants for? Uh, and what are the properties that they need to have and how do those properties work in those systems? At the end, I'll touch a little bit about uh, perovskites. Uh, I have uh, little to no expertise in perovskites. I think the, uh, the rest of the community here probably knows quite a bit more about me, but uh, I'll, I'll project a little bit about how the uh, encapsulant materials might, um, might function in a, in a perovskite device. So beginning with the history. So this is a, a timeline showing the uh, history of the development of these materials. So their kind of first development is shown here in black. And then their first use as a encapsulant for PV is shown in red. So you can see that the oldest polymer materials that were developed at the uh, beginning of the previous century, polyvinyl uh, butyral, as well as LDPE. Uh, in 1940, silicones were developed. And silicones, while not the first material on this list, were the first material to be used as an encapsulant for PV devices in the 50s. Uh, some other materials developed along the way, HDPE, um, not used as a PV encapsulant, but related to materials that are used in the 60s, EVA and ionomer uh, were developed. And you'll notice each of these uh, materials is sort of in a, uh, a row, a classification of the type of process and chemistry that's used to make it. So EVA and ionomer have something in common with LDPE. Uh, EVA begins to, or excuse me, PVB begins to be used for uh, PV applications, you know, nearly 40 years after it's been used for other applications in the 70s. Um, LLDPE, another type of polyethylene, is developed as well. EVA begins to be used uh, in the early 80s for PV, uh, followed by ionomer. In the 90s, uh, polyolefin elastomers are developed, and then about a decade later, they're the last of these materials to be uh, utilized as a uh, PV encapsulant on this list. So I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the, the history of these different materials um, chronologically. Uh, starting with PVB. PVB is actually a relatively complicated uh, polymer when you look at it on paper. It may be a bit surprising that it's the first of these to be developed given how complex it is, but acetate. Uh, then additional chemistry is done on the molecule to convert it into an alcohol. Myself a pointer to convert it into alcohol using this acid base hydrolysis. And so here we're cleaving the, um, the uh, ester bond on the, uh, on the vinyl acetate. And then there's an additional step where we do transesterification to yield the, um, the acetal molecule. Now, each of these steps uh, of modification is not uh, fully quantitative. Uh, so what happens is you have a little bit of the alcohol left as well as a little bit of the uh, vinyl acetate left. So the resulting molecule actually has different chemical functionalities. Uh, this is a free radical polymerization, um, which we'll, we'll note uh, the, the chemistry along the way. Um, the chain structure is amorphous, which is what gives it its extreme clarity, uh, one of its most valuable properties. This acid group enables it to have adhesion to glass without any additional formulation. Um, some of the properties that are important for uh, PV in particular, it uh, unfortunately has a pretty high WBTR. It transmits water relatively quickly, uh, and it has a poor uh, electrical resistivity. Um, the most common application everyone is most familiar with, of course, is safety glass, which has been used for, for um, about a century. LDPE is the next polymer on our list, um, showing the structure over here on the left. This is uh, polymerized by, with a free radical initiator combined with ethylene. Uh, the different colors here are trying to show the different generations of branching in the molecule. So you can have branches, and then you can have branches upon branches. That's what the blue and the green chain represents. But all of this is CH2, and you can see in the zoomed in molecule, this is a saturated hydrocarbon chain. It does have small chain branches, and these are what disrupt and control the crystallinity to some extent. Uh, but this is a relatively kinetically controlled process. Um, so there's relatively little uh, ability to design the structure of the molecule in detail. Um, it does have excellent electrical properties because the uh, has so few ingredients. It's such a simple process to uh, manufacture it. Unfortunately for the PV application, it's not really the right choice. It's uh, relatively hazy due to the crystallinity of the molecule, and it's also quite stiff. Um, one of the uh, applications that takes advantage of the properties that it has is um, insulation for wire and cable. And you can see this white thick layer here is a type of cross-linked LDPE. Moving on to silicone, I'm not an expert in uh, silicone chemistry, but as you may know, Dow, formerly Dow Corning, is now part of uh, Dow proper. And one of my colleagues, Guy Bukarn of uh, Dow Performance Silicones, as it's now called, uh, uh, contributed this slide. Um, 
So PDMS, polydimethyl siloxane, is uh, uh, synthesized in linears, as shown here, uh, using an acid to base catalyst and a condensation type of reaction. And then secondarily, a cross-linking reaction can be uh, conducted to turn it into rubber. And there's a couple different uh, chemistries, either an addition cure or a condensation type of cure. So there's a variety of chemistries available to, um, to cure a PDMS type of polymer. This has relatively long linear chains that can have this tunable cross-link density, which allows tunability of the modulus and some of the other physical properties of the PDMS. Um, it was first, uh, the first useful silicone, I actually didn't ask Guy what that uh, detail means, was produced at Corning in the early 1940s. And then in the 50s, the, um, it was first used as a PV encapsulant. Um, it has a lot of really interesting and unique properties. It's liquid at room temperature, and in fact, it's liquid across a very broad temperature range. You can control its cross-link density, as I mentioned, to two modulus. It has a little bit lower strength than organic polymers, but it's amorphous uh, liquid, so it's, it's very clear. It's very stable. It's both UV stable and temperature stable. So if you really want a, a material that's stable in a very broad temperature range and has relatively uniform mechanical properties across that temperature range, it's a good choice. And which is why it's used, as you uh, may know, in a lot of um, high temperature resistant kitchen uh, things. So here, this is like, you can actually bake with uh, PDMS types of molds, whereas you could not put many of these other materials into an oven and get anything uh, that you would want out. Moving on to HDPE. HDPE is a, a very simple structure, uh, the simplest of all that we're gonna look at here. It's just straight linear hydrocarbon. So it's unlike LDPE, which was synthesized with a peroxide, um, the chemistry that's allowing the synthesis is a particle supported metal catalyst. Um, and so this actually, uh, the chemistry that led to HDPE uh, won a Nobel Prize for Ziegler and Natta. Uh, you may have heard of, of Ziegler Natta polymerization or Ziegler Natta catalysts in 1963. Uh, this is done at much lower temperature. Um, we're no longer uh, in a pure ethylene environment like we were with LDPE. This might be done in solution or it might be done in, in, a, in a few other ways. Uh, there's no branching, unlike the LDPE, and that allows the ethylene to crystallize much more uh, significant extent, giving very high crystallinity. So these materials are very rigid and tough, and that crystallinity also causes them to be opaque. So this is, again, not a material that would be a, a good choice for an encapsulant, but it is very closely related to some of those. Here you see uh, you, uh, a common application is uh, piping. Moving on to EVA, a very familiar material to the PV community. So this is produced actually in the same type of process and chemistry as LDPE. We're combining ethylene with a free radical initiator, but we're also adding an additional monomer, which is vinyl acetate. So now we're copolymerizing ethylene and vinyl acetate in a similar type of process. We can see the structure here. We still have the branch on branch structure, but now the color I've added is indicating that we have both these short chain branches of uh, hydrocarbon, as well as these little branches that are the ethylene, uh, excuse me, the vinyl acetate. Um, this chemistry, uh, unfortunately, cannot copolymerize um, alpha olefin. So you might say, well, we could include something like uh, octene or hexene, as we'll see in a later slide, and get something similar to this. But unfortunately, the, the chemistry just doesn't work. But some other polar copolymers do work, as we'll see on a subsequent slide about um, ionomers. So this was first commercialized in the 60s. Um, the addition of the vinyl acetate allows you to tune the properties. So the LDPE, pretty much all LDPEs have roughly the same amount of crystallinity because there's little control over polymerization. But here, with the addition of the, the vinyl acetate, we can control the crystallinity. So we have a much broader modulus range. And with low crystallinity, we can get op optical clarity. Um, the, the VA range uh, used in, in PV is about 28 to 33 weight percent. But along with this polar functionality of the um, vinyl acetate molecule, we get a higher uh, relative uh, water permeation compared to something like LDPE. Moving on to ionomer, it's actually quite similar in structure to the vinyl acetate. But here, instead of um, copolymerizing vinyl acetate, we're copolymerizing a vinyl carboxylic acid monomer. Um, so again, very similar process to LDPE, peroxide uh, type of reaction. But now it's a two-step process. So first we make an acid polymer, which would have only this blue functionality. And then in a second step, we neutralize the acid with a metal ion, such as sodium, as shown here. But there's a few other uh, metal ions, such as zinc, that can also be done. So now we have an additional degree of freedom because we can control how much acid is in the polymer. And then we can also control to what extent do we neutralize that. So there's actually a pretty broad range of materials that can be designed in this um, ionomer uh, family. 
these polar ionic groups are um, highly polar, especially compared to the hydrocarbon as well as the acid. Um, so they actually tend to cluster up in the same way that oil and water separate, but because they're tied to the molecule, this clustering causes something like a cross-linking, although it's a, a reversible type of cross-linking. Uh, these materials are, uh, can be extremely clear, um, and the acid group that's present, like in the case of the PVB, can provide some native adhesion properties. So you don't, maybe don't need some additional formulation in order to get adhesion to uh, inorganic interfaces. Uh, they are much more rigid than EVA or PLE. We'll see some property comparisons later. And one of the premier applications for this, if you've ever seen kind of a high-end, uh, excuse me, a high-end perfume bottle, they have these ornate and kind of detailed caps. They look like glass, but it's actually, it's very difficult to form glass into the structure. And ionomer is used as a, a glass-like material to get this really cool geometry and this very extreme clarity that's used in these uh, perfume bottle caps. LLDPE, this can be confusing at first. This is linear low density polyethylene, but it's actually made by a completely different chemistry than uh, what we saw earlier, low density polyethylene. This is a particle supported metal catalyst. It is actually a similar type of catalyst to what's used with HDPE, but now we're actually copolymerizing an alpha olefin. And so that alpha olefin could be uh, propylene or uh, butene or octene or hexene, uh, a variety of choices are available. Um, again, like HDPE, this is done at lower temperatures. Um, the structure here now, unlike the HTPE, does have this short chain branching, which can be used to tune the crystallinity to some extent. Um, however, the, the distribution that I'm showing here is important. Um, it turns out that you don't get a uniform distribution of the co-monomer across all of your polymer chains. That can have a consequence on the properties. And in fact, it limits your ability to make elastomeric products that have a lot of co-monomer in them. The properties are generally similar to LDPE, but it's uh, much more tunable and, and can therefore be much more mechanically tough. Um, they're relatively hazy. They still have a comparable crystallinity to LDPE and a comparable modulus as well. So the uh, polyolefin elastomer at a first glance looks very similar. It's also the combination of ethylene and an alpha olefin, and it's catalytically polymerized. But here, the catalyst is no longer on a particle support necessarily. It is a uh, sort of a uh, homogeneous organometallic catalyst. And so the primary difference you see between um, this type of molecule and the previous is that now this co-monomer that we're incorporating is uniformly distributed across all of the polymer chains. Uh, another uh, quirk of this material is that it does have some long chain branching, although very much significantly less than uh, we saw with LDPE. So with this type of catalyst technology, we can now fully tune all the way from an amorphous liquid type of polymer all the way up to HDPE. So now we have a very broad temperature range, uh, excuse me, modulus range that's accessible by using this catalyst technology. And by controlling the alpha olefin content uh, to be a relatively high level, we can get good clarity as well as a low modulus. And everybody's familiar with the PoE that's used in um, encapsulations, but the other, uh, one of the other major applications of it is used to toughen polypropylene. So polypropylene is used for auto body parts like bumpers and, and uh, body panels, uh, but po polypropylene on its own is actually quite brittle, especially at lower temperatures, and the addition of PoE allows it to be uh, tough and impact resistant. So I wanted to say a bit about how the property control works um, in many of these polymer families, which are ethylene copolymers. So their physical properties are to a large extent determined by the ability of the ethylene sequences in them to crystallize. And so this cartoon shows uh, how ethylene crystallizes. So if you have linear sequences, you can get a uh, crystallization. But if you have defects on the chain, and those defects could be the alpha olefin short chain branching, or they could be the vinyl acetate as well, those are not going to uh, crystallize. And they, those chains that have those uh, long chain branches are excluded. So they can help to tie together the uh, crystallites. Um, and then the general uh, amount of crystallinity that's included is going to influence a lot of different properties. So if you have more crystallinity, you'll get a higher melting point, uh, you'll get a higher modulus, a stiffer material. Um, you can get a higher mechanical toughness. There's an asterisk there because this has a lot to do with lots of other aspects of the molecular design, including the molecular weight, but um, the crystallinity is important as well. But also the crystallites scatter light. So as you have more crystallinity, you lose optical clarity. And then uh, the uh, lowest end of crystallinity, you get stickiness. So high crystallinity limits stickiness, um, which is probably a, a good thing. Um, so you can get this really broad range of uh, material performance with just this single class of uh, materials by controlling ethylene crystallinity. 
at the very lowest end, you have kind of sticky liquid-like goopy types of polymers with a uh, melting point that may be at or below room temperature. These have a, uh, the lowest modulus. In principle, they could have the highest clarity, um, although because they're difficult to handle, um, the, the, they're, they're so sticky and um, not, not really uh, appropriate for something like a film like we use in uh, the, the TV application. They tend not to be uh, used for their clarity. But the most common material you might be familiar with here is EPDM, uh, which is a type of cured, uh, often liquid rubber that's used in um, automotive uh, types of applications. At the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, the very most crystalline, which is HDPE. So like we said, this is a very rigid and tough material. Uh, the melting point is about 130 degrees. So it's going to have the highest modulus across all these, but also be opaque. Everyone's probably familiar with consumer packaging. Um, so these are kind of flexible, but tough. The melting point is uh, 100 to 120 degrees. They have an intermediate modulus. As you see them, sometimes they seem quite clear, but in fact, the thickness of a consumer packaging film is often 10 times thinner than a uh, encapsulant. So as you make them thicker, they become optically hazy. And of course, the materials of interest here are ethylene elastomers. This would include um, EVA uh, in this category. It is an ethylene copolymer that has a melting point in this range and is elastic. Um, its, its physical properties are to a large extent controlled by its ethylene crystallinity. Okay, so up till now, we've been focused on the left end of this chart. I'm showing the encapsulant supply chain. So you have resin production where the raw material resin is manufactured. And so that's pellets that look like this, or in the case of silicone, it would be uh, potentially a liquid pre-polymer. Uh, then the next step in the supply chain is encapsulant fab fabrication, followed by module assembly. The encapsulant fabrication, depending upon the material, could also uh, have another step involved, uh, which I'll cover uh, in, uh, in a few slides. So what's in a uh, peroxide cured encapsulant? So this is the most uh, popular type of encapsulant in the market today, used in nearly all silicon wafer um, types of module devices. And on the right-hand side, we're kind of showing the anatomy of these formulations. So uh, it's 98% resin, and that resin may be EVA or PoE. They actually both use a very similar um, type of formulation chemistry, combined with a peroxide, a curing coagent, and an adhesion promoter. Um, the peroxide is designed to decompose at the lamination step of the assembly process and cross-link the polymer, which will provide thermal stability. The coagent is there to help that process um, happen more rapidly and to a greater extent. So it helps to um, build a network among the polymer molecules more quickly. And the adhesion promoter is there to provide adhesion to the inorganic interfaces. So this SiOCH3 bond um, can uh, yield an SiOSI bond, for example, on a glass interface. In addition to these three components, which are nearly ubiquitous in the market, um, there are some variety of UV absorbers, stabilizers, pH modifiers, um, et cetera, that are present at uh, smaller concentrations. Now, the key features that make this the uh, most popular choice are its relatively high clarity uh, of the encapsulant film. It's a relatively low cost. And the, uh, the, the structure that's providing thermal stability here is cross-linking. So that's different from a TPO encapsulant. Now TPO, I have in quotation marks here, because um, this is really a fairly broad and imprecise group of materials. Um, what makes a TPO a TPO is really its lack of peroxide, rather than any specific thing about the structure of the molecule itself. Um, mostly this type of encapsulant is used in thin film and other specialty modules to date. So in this case, the anatomy on the right, um, we see that this is mostly resin, um, so we no longer have the peroxide, we no longer have the coagent, we no longer have a small molecule to provide adhesion. Um, but the uh, molecule structure you see on the upper right, I'm showing, has uh, two components. So there's an R group and a Q group, and what does that mean? Well, the R group is there to control the crystallinity. So this is the same as we've seen previously. You want to get the modulus, you want to get the melting point, you want to get all those other properties um, designed how you want them. And so you include one uh, group to do that. The Q group is there to provide adhesion. So now instead of the adhesion being provided by this additional molecule that's included in the formulation, it's actually part of the polymer. And so there's a variety of different types of chemistries that can be used to provide this adhesion. You can use a similar um, 
a suboxane type of group shown here, but as we saw with PVB and ionomer, an acid group can also provide adhesion, and this is called an anhydride group. It's related to an acid group and provides a similar chemical functionality to provide adhesion. So you'll note that within this, uh, how I've grouped these, I'm actually considering ionomer to be a TPO, which is not the language the industry usually uses, but it has the critical features that the industry associates with a TPO. So I would say an ionomer is a type of TPO. Some of the key features of a TPO, um, it has much more rapid lamination. Uh, and this is because there's no peroxide decomposition chemistry that needs to take place. That chemistry takes time. And so the reason you're in the laminator for a longer period of time with a peroxide keratin capsule is because you have to wait for that chemistry to occur. Uh, there's fewer chemical interactions. So if you have a sensitive cell technology or uh, some other sensitive components within your module, um, this type of encapsulant is going to have fewer uh, chemical interactions with, with your uh, device. Now, instead of the cross-linking, which took place in the peroxide cured, we now have crystallinity of the molecule is what's actually providing the thermal stability. So we have to adjust the design of the raw material in order to get the thermal stability from a different source. Moving on to the manufacturing of both peroxide cured and uh, subsequently TPO. So this is uh, how these are generally made. So we take our raw materials, our raw pellets, maybe they're P POE or EVA, and we're going to combine those with the liquid components. All three of the peroxide coagent and alkoxysilane that I showed you previously are uh, liquids. Uh, those will then be kind of tumbled, mixed, uh, not in a truck, uh, but the, uh, the photo database uh, that I had access to with a copyright license to use did not have a picture of the uh, correct instrument, but it really, it's not very different from a, a cement mixer. It's just a cement mixer without the wheels, maybe. After tumbling to disperse these liquids, the uh, pellets will be stored in a warm chamber to absorb, help the liquid further absorb into the pellets. And now we have our soaked pellets and our other additives. Our other additives will come in the form of a pellet concentrate. So there'll be two pellets that are uh, mixed and then fed to an extruder. Um, this is a very small uh, kind of laboratory scale extruder, um, but in, in reality they'd be much bigger than this, um, where the film is extruded. Now the melting point of the encapsulant, like I said, it could be in the range of 60 to 90 degrees. Um, so let me remove this thing. Um, the peroxide decomposes rapidly above about 140. We'll show a little bit more about that later. Um, so you have a temperature window where you have to really manage temperature quite carefully. If during the extrusion, the polymer gets too hot, then the peroxide will start to decompose, which means the molecular weight will go up, which means the viscosity will go up, which means that it generates more heat, which means that the temperature will go up again. So you can actually get this feedback loop in the extruder if the temperature gets too high where it crosslinks in the extruder, uh, which is very undesirable. So you have to be quite careful as you're manufacturing this to make sure that the extrusion is done carefully. And generally, you want to keep it below about 105 degrees. After extrusion, um, there is a thermal treatment step. Uh, this is another case where I didn't quite have the right picture. Um, here I'm showing cookies, uh, but the encapsulant does not turn into cookies. But it's a very similar kind of uh, oven or heat tunnel that the encapsulant passes through after it's extruded to uh, what's shown in this, in this image. So the encapsulant needs to have dimensional stability when it's laminated. You don't want your encapsulant to shrink uh, during lamination. The extrusion process imparts stress into the film. Uh, so you need to remove that stress so that that shrinkage doesn't happen in the laminator. So there's a secondary step here where you provide this heat treatment to the encapsulant film to prevent it from shrinking later. TPOs are manufactured a bit differently. Um, there's a couple of ways here. As we mentioned, you can make, uh, uh, TPO is a pretty broad category, but one of the ways is to use a modified T, uh, POE, where you start with your raw POE pellets, as well as a peroxide and whatever group you want to graft onto the polymer. It could be a silane or an acid. Um, so then you do a twin screw extrusion and this peroxide reacts with the silane to graft this new functionality onto the polymer backbone. This is a different type of peroxide than we saw previously. And this peroxide is fully consumed. So by the time we get to extrusion, this perox the, the film extrusion, I should say, uh, this peroxide is no longer present. Of course, you can also make a uh, different kind of uh, TPO. You can co-polymerize, as we saw previously. For example, an ionomer is a polar tur polymer. It has groups that control crystallinity, and it has groups that provide adhesion to the glass. So you get the necessary molecular components of a TPO but through a different pathway. 
Either way, uh, those functionalized pellets will be combined in the same way with any other additives in a pellet concentrate. They'll go through the same cast film extrusion process. But now, since we don't have a peroxide in the pellets, this is no longer as challenging. So we can actually extrude at a high temperature. We don't have to worry about this feedback loop of, uh, of uh, the runaway chemical reaction. Finally, we do the same type of thermal treatment. OK, so that's you know, what the raw materials are and what their properties are controlled by, as well as what's in the formulation and how we manufacture them. But there's a big question I jumped over. What are encapsulants really for? What are they doing? And what I'm trying to show here is that they're, they're really a single part that has a lot of important roles, um, including mechanical isolation. Um, so any, any mechanical impact or any mechanical load that's placed on the exterior of the module, we generally don't want that to be conveyed to the, uh, the more delicate cells internally. So the modulus needs to be controlled in order to provide that in insulation. Uh, they're uh, providing optical coupling and optical clarity. Um, so the, uh, when you pass through different media of different densities, you can get uh, loss of light. So this is a sort of an optical coupling process, but also needs to be uh, high, highly transmittant um, as well as provide adhesion in order to give that coupling. So there are different uh, properties associated with, with how that coupling and clarity work. It's an environmental seal to a certain extent, although maybe not the best environmental seal as we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, WBTR and adhesion to some extent control your ability to keep some of the elements out of the modulus. It's an electrical insulator. Um, it's not a relied upon insulator, but its resistive properties are important in uh, many aspects. It needs to provide weatherability, so it needs to provide some st stability to the, um, the module and the, de uh, the device. So it needs to be chemically inert and thermally stable to the environment that it's going to be exposed to. It's also in some cases, especially in, in a, if you think of a, like a frameless type of device, um, it's providing mechanical structure. So it's actually maybe what's holding the module together in some cases. So it's combination of modulus, adhesion, and thermal stability may be actually holding the entire thing together. So it's, it's an adhesive in some sense. In addition to these critical properties, it needs to be handleable. We need to be able to uh, turn it into the part that we want to turn it into. This is why I mentioned kind of why we don't use the sticky goop type of uh, polyolefin previously. It needs to be processable. So we need to be able to turn it into a film. We need to be able to lay it up in a, a module assembly process. Of course, it needs to be safe. It needs to be functional in a broad temperature range for 30 years. And of course, we don't want to pay much for it if we don't have to. Moving on to the critical properties associated with all of the different roles that the encapsulant has. Um, the WTBR and WVTR, the water vapor transmission rate in the upper left. Um, here, uh, this is a relatively complicated property um, as I'll, I'll explain on a, on a subsequent slide. So I, I didn't want anybody to cite my numbers. I'm just trying to give a rough ballpark uh, range of the relative WVTR of the different materials you see here, PDMS having the highest WBTR, PBB is also quite high in EVA, and then uh, PoE somewhat lower and ionomer among the materials here has the, the lowest WBTR. The resistivity uh, also can be a pretty broad range for even a single material class. Um, for example, the, the PDMS and the PoE have relatively broad resistivity ranges as, as shown in this plot, but among these PBB tends to have the lowest resistivity. Uh, on the upper right, I'm showing the room temperature modulus. The, the modulus can, in fact, be extremely temperature dependent, and that temperature dependence depends to some extent on the proximity to the glass transition temperature. Um, so you can see that we have a very broad range of modulus for PVB in particular, and that's because PVB's um, glass transition temperature is close to room temperature. Now, in, in practice, um, this is just for the raw material, what I'm showing here, but in practice, PVB as it's used in lamination applications, generally has maybe 20 to 30% plasticizer, which modifies its, um, its raw modulus. But you can see that the um, EVA and polyolefin have a comparable uh, modulus. Uh, PDMS is uh, capable of being a little bit softer. Ionomer is generally uh, significantly higher. Uh, in addition to uh, these properties, um, of course, we're interested in price. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the TPO requires some additional chemistry. Uh, PBB has multiple steps of chemistry. Ionomer has multiple steps of chemistry relative to EVA and PoE. So generally, they have a, a little bit of a cost adder. PDMS has an entirely different uh, supply chain uh, of raw materials. So most of the rest of these are hydrocarbons. PDMS, of course, is a silicon-based material. So it has some additional uh, energy costs as well. 
the clarity of all of these is pretty good. So when we say the clarity is, is better or worse, we're, we're talking about relatively small values. Most of these are uh, ballpark 90% plus transmittance. Um, some of them are a bit better. Uh, so PBB, ionomer, and PDMS are the most capable of the highest uh, transmittance. And then TPO, as we'll show in a moment, um, can have a little bit lower clarity because it relies on crystallinity to provide structure. Uh, finally, um, in some cases where you care about uh, sodium transport, as in the case of uh, uh, PIDS or PID shunting, you might care about the, some other properties of the uh, material, such as its ability to be a sodium barrier. Uh, PVA and PBB are, are known to be uh, not so great at, as sodium barriers. And TPO I have is either or because, again, TPO is a broad category. You could make a TPO out of a lot of different molecules. Um, so it depends on what the chemistry of the TPO is. So I'll be telling you a little bit more about each of these critical properties or most of these critical properties, I should say. Uh, first on WBTR, I have uh, borrowed a figure from a really excellent Duramat webinar. I think most of the audience is probably familiar with the, the Duramat consortium. So this is a Duramat webinar uh, from April, 2020. That was, uh, I think entirely on the topic of WBTR. So it's quite a, a deep and complicated topic. Uh, but what's trying to be shown here is uh, if you want to prevent a certain amount of moisture ingress over a 30 year period, let's say that over 30 years of exposure, you want less than 10 milliliters in total to permeate per meter squared of your device. Well, that means you would need a WBTR of 10 to the minus three uh, grams per meter squared day. So if you have a very sensitive device and even 10 microliters will damage your device over that time period, then you would need to have a WBTR of 10 to the minus six in order to prevent that amount of moisture from permeating. And this is a, a, a quote from that, uh, from a slide from that webinar. Uh, meaningful moisture barriers for PV require WBTR of less than 10 to the minus four. And further reasonable thickness polymer films can only get down to 10 to the minus two. So this is a really important point um, and kind of calls back to the, the joke I made at the top. Really no polymer. Um, much less a polymer with all of the other property requirements of an encapsulant can be the primary moisture barrier if you're trying to, if you're this sensitive to moisture. Um, you know, ordinary silicon devices are not this sensitive to moisture, but of course, um, some devices are more sensitive. Um, so a polymer on its own really doesn't have the ability to be the primary moisture barrier. Things like Edge seals are polymer based, but they're actually loaded with inorganic desiccants. So you're combining a polymer with some other uh, material technology or chemistry in order to provide additional mo moisture barrier in that case. And you might be wondering, okay, well, if, if no polymer can provide a moisture barrier, uh, OLED devices do exist. So how do you make an OLED device and provide this level of barrier? Um, there's another class of materials that are also called encapsulants, maybe a bit confusingly, that are made from thin inorganic barrier films and multi-layers of those. Um, I won't be going into very much more detail than what you see on the slide about this, um, but these types of multi-layer barriers or, or inorganic barriers are made usually from aluminum oxide vapor deposition uh, in relatively thin layers, and you can also make multi-layers of polymer inorganic, polymer inorganic, for example. And these can be deposited onto, for example, a, a PET substrate. So again, this is a different class of, of thing, also called an encapsulant. Um, and I've, I've included a, a reference here to a pretty good, uh, at, at least from my perspective, pretty good review of uh, this type of encapsulation technology for uh, these uh, very sensitive types of devices. Okay, another property that we care about is transmittance. Um, so here I'm showing a uh, UV biz transmittance measurement for a few different encapsulants. Uh, two of them are EVA or PoE like, um, one of which the blue one here has no UV absorber. So you can kind of see the uh, sort of natural state of transmittance or the optical properties of the polymer. And then the orange one is showing, okay, this one has a UV absorber that's designed at a certain wavelength. We're also showing a TPO uh, that also has a UV absorber, but at a different wavelength. And you can see the TPO has very significantly less transmittance in this case. Uh, and this is due to the crystallinity, due to the design of the TPO itself. Again, the TPO, in order to maintain its thermal stability, relies upon crystallinity, and crystallinity causes light scattering. Um, just a, a reminder again, TPO is a broad category. So when I'm showing a TPO here, this does not mean that all TPOs uh, look like this or have a transmittance like this. It's a very broad category. Uh, in fact, 
TPOs are often designed without really any regard for their transmittance because they may be used in thin film devices where the encapsulant is behind the solar cell, not in front of it. So in some cases, TPOs are not even designed for clarity. Um, again, UV absorbers can be added, and the purpose of the UV absorber is to control UV exposure of other components. So the UV absorber in the encapsulant is protecting the back sheet or protecting the cell. Uh, there are additionally UV stabilizers that are added to protect the encapsulant itself. A little bit more about resistivity as well. Um, resistivity measurements, uh, I, I'm going into some detail here to show exactly how they work. Generally, we're clamping a polymer encapsulant between two electrodes. Um, imposing a uh, potential difference across those electrodes, uh, which causes any ions or mobile charge that are in the material to migrate. If you have dipoles, they might rotate. And then we're measuring the um, amount of current uh, around this circuit as we do this measurement. Um, so we call it resistivity as if it's a resistor, but in fact, it's a dielectric and, and the uh, electrical property is a little bit more nuanced than a resistivity measurement can truly convey. The other thing that's important about this measurement is that it provides information about the concentration and mobility of mobile ions or other mobile charge that are in the encapsulant when we do the measurement. It does not necessarily provide information about the mobility of ions in the encapsulant that it may encounter in the device. So if ions are being supplied uh, from the glass, sodium being the classical example, this measurement doesn't necessarily tell you anything about how those sodium ions will move because those sodium ions are not in the measurement. So here's even more information about a resistivity measurement. Here we're showing the, really the raw data. So how are we doing this? We're measuring current as a function of time. And you can note that this is on a, a log log scale. So the time of the measurement here, this is a very uh, unusually long uh, resistivity measurement. Uh, uh, here it's, it's going for two and a half days and you see the current is, is continuing to go down over this uh, time period. And so the way generally resistivity as a metric is calculated is that a time is chosen, for example, one minute or 10 minutes or 60 minutes um, to say, okay, well, we're gonna stop here and we're gonna call the current at this particular point, the, the one that we care about and calculate the resistivity. So you can see the resistivity would range across um, maybe more than an order of magnitude, depending on the time that you chose here. Now there are a variety of standards uh, that say, well, you should do it this way or you should do it that way. Um, but my experience has been that in practice, none of these are really consistently used with the same parameters. So when somebody's describing resistivity, it's uh, good to ask, well, what, what do you mean exactly? Why might you care about resistivity? I'm not gonna go into too much detail here uh, about PID. Um, I think it's a, a pretty big topic, but I just wanna mention uh, in, in silicon devices, we know about PIDS, which is associated with sodium transport. And in other types of silicon devices, especially bifacial, um, there's PIDP, polarization-based. And depending upon the type of PID that is impacting a device or a system, you might want a different property. You might care about a different property. So if you care about sodium transport, then the property that you care about is the, the ability of the um, encapsulant to convey sodium, uh, not necessarily its total resistivity. On the other hand, for PID peak, it does appear that the total conductivity or the total resistivity is the critical factor. Of course, with perovskite devices, there may be entirely different or maybe neither uh, of these me PID mechanisms, but this is in general the reason that uh, resistivity is considered a, a critical factor for, um, for device performance uh, in, with an encapsulant. Okay, so moving to the uh, last part of the talk, um, how are perovskite devices different from uh, the, the, you know, the devices that the industry is very familiar with. Uh, of course, I am not an expert here. Uh, and the, most, the property that I'm most familiar with is their chemical sensitivity. So of course, uh, perovskites are, are very significantly more sensitive to water than conventional silicon devices are. They may be sensitive to other species and there may be some electrochemistry uh, associated with that sensitivity that you might need to be concerned about. Uh, for example, we know about some PIDC, PID corrosion types of mechanisms in silicon, and there could be similar mechanisms in uh, perovskites due to their chemical sensitivity. Uh, perovskites are thermally sensitive, so um, the process that's used to assemble a module generally goes up to 150 degrees. If the device is not stable in that temperature range, then you might not want to assemble the module that way. You might want to assemble it using a lower lamination temperature, perhaps, or you might want to use a different process entirely. 
Um, thin film devices, as perovskite has the potential to be, uh, can be done on a, a different type of substrate than we're uh, familiar with. So for example, a flexible device using flexible uh, sub or super straights. And then there's other opportunities when you're with a thin film device to do a different process to lamination, as we already mentioned. So you could have a continuous process like a roll to roll process. So now you've got a very different module assembly process, which may demand a different type of encapsulant or a different type of device structure. But from what I've seen so far, people are generally leveraging existing module designs to the uh, first, um, first demonstrated perovskite devices. So some examples of existing uh, module designs are shown here on the left. Uh, for a wafer device, it's a very conventional, now conventional module design, uh, but with the addition of an edge seal. And again, as we already mentioned, this polyisobutylene edge seal is loaded with a chemical or physical desiccant to uh, inhibit the progress of moisture into the, um, into the module. Uh, polyisobutylene has relatively poor mechanical properties. I've seen it occasionally suggesting, well, maybe we could just use it as the encapsulant itself. Um, but again, it's, it's barrier properties to a large extent come from being loaded with this desiccant. And when you load it with desiccant, it's no longer transparent. So in addition to its kind of mechanical deficiencies, it has optical deficiencies. So it doesn't make a good choice for an encapsulant material. Uh, TPO encapsulants are often used. Um, in these types of devices, uh, again, since you care about moisture, uh, you probably also care about acetic acid, which can be generated by the EBA-based encapsulants. Uh, most TPOs have a lower WBTR uh, than a comparable choice like EBA. They don't have peroxide, uh, which can potentially provide some negative chemical interaction, both with the device as well as potentially with the PIB, which we'll show on a later slide. Uh, and then uh, TPOs are also chosen, as I mentioned, some, TPO, some thin film devices don't require clarity. So as we're showing in the bottom left here, if your device architecture looks something like this, then the clarity of your uh, encapsulant is really not a critical factor. On the other hand, some thin film devices have a, an architecture more like the, the bottom one. The advantage of this would be that, well, now you can use the encapsulant to uh, provide some optical control like screening UV. Um, the initial perovskite devices, uh, as, I've, as I've seen, seem likely to leverage these designs. Uh, tandem devices are obviously going to look more like the top. Uh, perovskite devices may look like the bottom, but as, as we've said, they could be using different assembly processes. Uh, people have talked about uh, roll to roll, so that wouldn't look like this either of the two uh, pictures here. Uh, finally, you know, why are TPOs preferred for thin film devices? Um, one of the reasons is concerns with peroxide. So here we're showing a heat transfer model of the module lamination process. So over time, we're passing through the pins phase of a laminator, the press phase, and then the post laminated cool. So about four minutes in here, we're uh, providing contact with the uh, hot plate of the laminator, and we see the temperature rapidly increase in red. Um, on the right, I'm plotting the remaining peroxide. So as if this is a uh, peroxide cured encapsulant, we can model the decomposition kinetics of that peroxide. And that modeled uh, decomposition is shown here in black. And so you can see that until we get above maybe 125 degrees, we don't see very significant decomposition, but then it begins to rapidly decompose as the temperature continues to increase. However, even at the end of the uh, lamination cycle, we can see that there's still a, a relatively substantial amount of peroxide remaining, even under these conditions. So the general considerations here are that you know conventional encapsulants peroxides only decompose above 125 or 130. So if your device is not capable of withstanding that temperature for an extended period of time, then this type of encapsulant may may not be the right the right one. Um, on the other hand, if we imagined a lower temperature peroxide, consider the manufacturing process I told you about earlier, where we have to stay in this careful window of temperatures in order to prevent the uh, runaway thermal reaction in the extruder. So it'd be quite challenging to go to a lower temperature peroxide as well. Um, so in a perovskite, you can have interactions potentially between the peroxide and the cell. Um, and like I mentioned, the, the temperature may be incompatible. The other issue is, you know, if you're relying on an edge seal, there's actually a known negative interaction between peroxides and polyisobutylene, um, showing a, a reference here where uh, the molecular weight of a polyisobutylene was reduced by a factor of five um, in some experiments with dichumal peroxide. So uh, polyisobutylene in general, the way it reacts with peroxide is to decompose, to lose molecular weight. 
This is different from EV8 and polyolefin. When they react with, with peroxide, they gain molecular weight. So if the peroxide is in contact with the PID, it may cause degradation to the, the edge seal, which could uh, ruin your moisture barrier if that's what you're relying on. Okay, wrapping it up. Um, since the development of PV devices in the 50s, uh, a wide variety of polymeric materials have been utilized as encapsulants. Today, EVA and PoE are the most popular uh, encapsulant choices. The early perovskite devices that I'm familiar with are, are likely leveraging uh, what's available as far as encapsulants, and those encapsulants are not necessarily designed for perovskite devices. They're designed for silicon cell devices, um, both in performance as well as assembly. Um, one of the uh, seeming the leverageable choices is TPO. Uh, again, that's a very broad and poorly defined encapsulant category, but it is a, a likely choice given its, uh, its properties. Uh, moisture barrier is the most well-known critical property um, due to the moisture sensitivity of perovskite devices. Uh, and definitely some encapsulants have much better moisture barrier than others, but uh, as we saw earlier on the WBTR slide, a polymer only barrier is unlikely to be sufficient. Um, so uh, this is an open question. Uh, my expertise is in the, the polymer space, and I think many on the line are, are device uh, engineering space. So what are the additional considerations for perovskite devices, uh, both in the materials that enable the device to be durable, but then those materials also need to be compatible with whatever assembly processes are being considered for these devices. Uh, so with that, I will uh, conclude the, the talk and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Brian. That was great. Um, Joe, were you going to lead us off with some questions? All right. Well, Brian, I'll start you off with an easy one here while we wait for Joe. Um, could you comment on the typical thickness ranges used for um, each of these different encapsulants and particularly they're interested in the ionomer? Oh, um... Ionomer has been approached in a couple of ways. Um, ionomer can be used as a, um, a standard encapsulant, and a standard encapsulant's thickness is about a half a millimeter, um, maybe more like 0.45 millimeters is maybe a standard thickness. Um, ionomer has been approached as, as, a, as a conventional encapsulant like that. I've also seen some who have tried to apply ionomer as an additional thin layer. So you might use an EVA encapsulant combined with an additional layer of ionomer to provide uh, some barrier property to the uh, system. But in general, the thickness of all the different materials is relatively standardized at uh, about half a millimeter, maybe a little bit less. Um, in many cases, glass glass devices use a slightly thicker um, encapsulant thickness uh, standard. And I think that's to provide, uh, because, the, because the glass is not compliant, um, you can get some close contacts uh, with the uh, with the electronic components and the, the rear glass uh, relative to a, a backseat device. Great. Um, keeping on with the ionomer theme, uh, we have a question about how an ionomer could be a sodium barrier if it actually contains sodium, or in that case, are you referring to only the ion ionomers with uh, the zinc ions as the neutralizer? Uh, in fact, it can be a uh, sodium barrier if it has sodium. I mean, the, the issue is that the sodium needs to be immobile more than it needs to be absent. Um, but I, 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 I do suspect that out of concern for the potential of sodium migration, that the, the more likely choice would be to use a zinc ionomer. But in principle, a, a sodium containing material can still be a sodium barrier. Great. Um... Okay, so moving on to a slightly different topic. Um, can you make any comment about the oxygen transmission rate of the materials? So you talked a lot about the WVTR um, and if established encapsulants provide protection against oxygen ingress, if you know. Uh, it is known, I don't have those data here. Um, uh, different materials are chosen for different oxygen barrier. I, I don't have those uh, data handy, but um, these materials and related materials, as we've shown here, are used in lots of packaging applications, uh, for example, meat packaging. So there's lots of other areas where the oxygen and water barrier are important. So in general, there's a body of knowledge about these properties, although I, I don't have it handy here. Okay. Um, 
so the next question, I think this got answered on a later slide, but no reason not to reiterate. Um, they were wondering about the shortcomings silicones have as encapsulants since silicone chemistry is so tunable to the different applications. Yes, uh, good question. Um, one of the biggest issues is the cost. Um, silicones are a uh, much more expensive material than the other options here. Of course, they do come with some properties that none of the other materials have, especially their uh, chemical and thermal stability. Um, but in general, of course, the, the goal of uh, PV technology is to reach cost parity with other energy technologies. And so if we can get the job done with a, uh, uh, a less expensive material, then we would prefer to do so. But uh, certainly PDMS has some uh, unique properties uh, in, in its category. Great. Okay, so back to the WVTR topic. Um, it seems to me that WVTR is the critical parameter for perovskite PV. And I can't see how a single encapsulant layer without some metal oxide interlayer will ever get us to 10 to the minus six or lower, which I think is essential. Um, they're asking, is this off the mark or? Uh, fully agree, totally okay. agree, absolutely, yes. I mean, that's, that's the message of this slide. Um, you know, when we say even that you know, reasonable thickness polymer films only get to 10 to the minus two. Even that polymer, what, what, what is that polymer? Well, that's probably some exotic uh, fluoropolymer, right? It's gonna be something that's expensive and it's gonna be something that doesn't do any of the other things a, a, an encapsulant needs to do. So even the best polymer, if we were able to combine all the best properties of all the best polymers, it still wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so either the device needs to, uh, improve its performance by reducing its sensitivity to moisture or an additional component uh, like these, these thin or organic barriers is probably going to be necessary. Um, so one of those two, and I, I don't know much about perovskite devices, so I'll, I'll leave that to the experts on whether or not the device's sensitivity can be improved. Excellent, good, good answer and definitely good insight. Um, so something slightly different here. Do you have an idea on the properties of polyurethane materials compared to all of the ones that you've mentioned in this talk? Yeah, polyurethane comes up occasionally. It's not a very popular encapsulant choice. It has a relatively low moisture barrier. Um, and I'm not very aware of it being used significantly commercially, so I didn't include it. Um, but uh, moisture barrier is, is one of its challenges. It's, it's also, I think, less UV weatherable uh, than some of the other options. Great. Um, okay, so here's an interesting question. Um, for some perovskite applications, it might be useful to actually have a non-transparent encapsulant. Um, do some black encapsulants exist or is it possible to actually color some of these transparent or not totally clear encapsulants? Sure, I mean, I, I have some pictures here where you see uh, you know, black pipe, for example, on the HDPE. You know, HDPE is white, um, but we simply can add dye molecules um, to a polymer to achieve essentially any color that you would like. Um, so black has not been a popular choice uh, historically. Um, white, there are actually lots of white encapsulants that have been made. Um, so technology exists. You have some concerns about, well, will that dye molecule bleed uh, you know, into some part of your system that you don't want it? Uh, but there are engineer, engineering solutions to that as well. So in principle, yes, you could add a, a dye molecule to, to any of these and get a colored encapsulant. Great. Okay, so we're almost at the hour, and I think this question is a good one to end with. Um, I'm going to abbreviate it a little bit, but the question is, if there's a good contact point, if smaller companies or academic researchers are interested in following up with um, some sample experiments with some small quantities of material, should they get in touch with you or someone else? Sure, you can get in touch with me. Um, Dow does have many of these materials in our portfolio, although not all of them. Um, and we do have the capability to formulate and fabricate film internally. I should, I should mention that um, you know, from the point of view of, of Dow, uh, we're in this area. We're a raw material manufacturer. Um, we formerly had a uh, film product called Enlight, but we no longer uh, manufacture that film product. We are manufacturing a resin product. Um, just, just for some clarity, because there's been some, some confusion about that in the past. Great. Um, so yeah, folks, if you need to get in touch with Brian, uh, feel free to reach out through the US MAP website. 
um, and we can make sure everyone is in touch. Um, Brian, if you don't mind putting your contact information in the chat, um, I'm sure people would be in touch with you. Um, with that, thank you. Uh, there were some other questions I think were unanswered, but we can pull those for you, Brian, um, and make sure you see those. Um, thanks for the tutorial. I learned a lot. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, hope to see you at the next one. Okay, contact info is in the chat. It's bmhabersberger at dow.com. Great. Thanks a lot, Brian. Yep. Thank you.